3G shutdown. Uh, put this little slide together. You can see that uh, AT&T and T-Mobile have already started in some areas. Uh, Verizon's looking at the end of the year and U.S. Cellular's looking at uh, the beginning of next year, which literally I think it's December 31st for Verizon and January 1st for U.S. Cellular. Um, so very, very little time between them. But uh, are you already seeing uh, a lot of this, David? Uh, well, we're seeing we're seeing some refresh activity from it, right? Some older model devices, some that we'll actually get into here. Um, you know, we're getting refreshed with newer equipment, partially due to the 3G shutdown, yeah. um, you know, making sure that you have the newer technology, as I'd mentioned before. Um, a lot of our 3G device, 3G only devices are already end of life. They're already, you know, no longer supported mm -hmm. by us. Um, but even some of the older LTE models um, have some challenges due to this 3G shutdown. So we had some initiatives early on on getting some modem firmware releases to help mitigate um, some of the challenges that would be faced by it, only to find out they're non-issues um, because of how things were actually deployed on the carrier networks to begin with. But we've seen some activity, um, but not not a ton. I mean, most people have already upgraded to newer LTE technology yeah, already. Sure. So. Um, yeah, Reed, uh, this is Reed Perryman. He's our director of sales, as I had mentioned. Uh, just joined us. Thanks for having me with yeah, us. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And hey, David, glad you could uh, carry the torch here. Uh, sorry for our attendees today. Run a little behind, last day of the month, sales and all. So, but we're gonna have a good show today. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think we can, uh, do you have anything uh, to add here to uh, the 3G shutdown? Just no, anything you're seeing? Nothing to this. I know that a lot of, one thing, I say no, but then I have one thing, <laughs> right? So one thing I'd actually add is a lot of utility customers out there, uh, anything to do with SCADA, anything that was inherently low bandwidth, right? Whether in the public sector or commercial application, We've even seen large ATM kiosk companies uh, with micro POS transactors or digital signage companies that didn't require a lot of bandwidth really invest and stay on 3G compatible technology for a long, long, long time. And because we have these lines in the sand, and what I can tell you, I've seen T-Mobile uh, really sticking to their guns, right? We had a public transit agency that had uh, 3G units in their coaches completely get shut off and they were in the middle of transitioning to Cradle Point a 5G platform, actually, so two generations up. But there are customers out here today that need to upgrade that device. And I know that with RC and in Cradle Point, right, there are a number of devices, whether on 4G, which we think is here to stay mm -hmm. for the long haul, um, or to 5G for certain applications. Uh, we can help navigate that transition with an effective endpoint with at least five plus years of runway in front of it in terms of support perspective and usability perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Let's uh, jump in. So what are some of the reasons for upgrading? You know, we've got security, performance, uh, monitoring capabilities. I'm sure a lot of people kind of have an idea of, you know, why uh, LTE or 5G is better than 3G, but I mean, uh, what else are we dealing with here? Yeah, I'll let David take this first, right, from the engineering perspective, especially maybe around uh, security and monitoring capabilities, why a transition would be important from a legacy device to a supported device. Well, so uh, in, in terms of cradle point devices and, and our subscriptions and how everything works, you know, as we enter an end of life process with the devices, uh, there becomes a time where there's no subscription term that will extend past a certain date, right? And what happens when you reach the end of subscription is the device may still function in a light capacity, you know, providing simple connectivity um, on the network, but you would lose a lot of the visibility, actually all visibility to that device, what you're doing with the device, configurability of the device, um, and to that point, the security, right? Um, it would still maintain its stateful firewall, but that's about it. Any of the advanced security features would no longer be functional. Um, so any IPS or IDS that you may have running and stuff like that, that's as it pertains to us. But in general, um, once we reach an end of life for a product, you usually stop receiving firmware updates, right? So if there are any security vulnerabilities or patches that are needed, um, you may be vulnerable at those point in times. So I will make a note that throughout our Throughout our end of life process with the device, we might reach a point where we say a last firmware is X for a given product. Um, but if there is a bad enough security vulnerability, 
um, that is gonna patch our entire portfolio lineup, we will go back with some older products and patch those as well, providing a newer firmware to at least cover those security vulnerabilities based on how many devices are still out in the wild, right? Because there are still a lot of customers that either can't or don't have the ability to upgrade um, their, their devices over time sometimes. Yeah, and, and what I'd probably add on to that is even though you guys go back to some of those legacy devices, if that breach is severe enough, one thing I know about a end of life and then end of support, right? So there's end of life, end of sale, and then five years later, there's end of support. End of support is really the end of the line once your active NetCloud license, which connects you to that brain, right? NetCloud, NetCloud OS uh, runs out, it's out. To David's point, you can do minimal accessibility. So from a monitoring perspective, from a configuration change, remote troubleshooting perspective, all these reasons you invest in a platform that can be centrally managed by one pane of glass, that's all taken away. But here's the thing, even with some of those legacy devices, David, I would be willing to bet cut off from the brain, right, the OS, it's probably been a manual process to go and apply the security patch, unless I'm wrong on that, but I don't see how it gets to that endpoint if it's not connected to the NetCloud OS. Right, yeah, I mean, once the ultimate subscription expires and it's no longer connected to the NetCloud mm -hmm. system, the NetCloud manager system, um, there's really no way to update it beyond that right. point, right? Um, but during that, period of life, the, the period of supported life, we'll call it, um, you are still able to do that. And, and I believe later on we touch on uh, one of the products actually that just, that is nearing its end of life, right? It's end of supported life, um, actually just got a new firmware update, I think this past right. two weeks or something because of a security vulnerability, a couple of them actually that had to be patched. So even though the device is, uh, we'll, we'll call it six months. I don't have the exact dates in my head, um, but six months until it's end of supported life, you know, and its last firmware model was actually about two or three years ago. We did provide an updated one because the security warranted right, it. Right. So, um, but just to touch on performance, well, aside from security, which we know that anyone that's running a POS terminal or anyone in that public safety space, right? Security should be top of mind for you for different compliances, PCI, CGIS, so on and so forth. But let's talk about performance, right? Because if you're out there and let's take an endpoint from Cradle Points Light Card that is approaching end of support, again, end of support, meaning, you know, you can't buy it anymore. It's been five years since then, but you can't get firmware updates. You can't manage it, license it, et cetera, right? It's got bare minimum connectivity with no bells and whistles that make Cradle Point great at that point. Uh, so let's talk about, say, the IBR 1100 uh, LP6 model, because I, and I think all models of the IBR 1100, and then even the IBR 900, its successor, the LP6 model, all have this May 31st end of support date, right? So let's talk about performance-wise, why you would, you know, not only everything we described before, getting the most out of your investment, centralized management, security, firmware updates, uh, so on and so forth. But from a performance perspective, let's take currently where Cradle Point's product line is, and we'll go through some of these product points. Mm -hmm. uh, on 5G specifically, let's say the R1900, Cradle Point's flagship mobility router right now that's 5G and 4G, backwards compatible. But you take, let's say the IBR900, LP6, which I believe was a CAT6 modem, right? The R1900, which is a 5G CAT20 modem. And so you're leaping from LP6 to Cradle Point releasing their 600M, which was their CAT12, and then the CAT18, the 1200M-B, and now the CAT20. So in terms of CATs, you gain 14 CATs in that progression, right? So I know we're talking about it kind of in a funny way, but track with me here. But we're finding on the LTE network, going back to the uh, IBR 900 on an LP6, carrier aggregation being what it was, which is really that 4G advanced capability. Hey, you got one band on early 4G, but there's more bands out there. Let's combine them, right? Carrier aggregation to get more uh, throughput or push more traffic. And so from CAT6 to CAT20, what we're finding field test wise, 
especially for customers that have a need for this kind of bandwidth, is that the experience is going to be really five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times better because the carrier aggregation capabilities, uh, again, just on the 4G network, not even talking about 5G, but just on the 4G network provides that much more in terms of its carrier aggregation capability that it's driving that kind of serious throughput. So in a mobility application, right, uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about guns and hoses, fire departments, uh, EMS, right? They've got record management. They've got CAD, not super data intensive applications. What I am talking about, though, is we have a customer, Hempel Coach Company. They've got some older devices. They provide coaches for celebrity clients. They describe to us that these clients at any given time have Apple TV going, have Xbox Live going, have streaming going, Netflix, HBO, what have you, are downloading files, people are on their mobile clients, right? They're currently running LP6 modems and they're looking at the 1900, but they're not sold on 5G, but it's not a 5G conversation yet, right? You don't understand cat six versus cat 20, you're going to have probably three, four, five times the experience, the bandwidth to provide to those customers. So in certain applications, right, upgrading um, is absolutely the way to go. Those devices that are legacy at this point on Cradle, for Cradle Point that are 4G devices, 4G then is nothing compared to 4G now in the most mature point of 4G as a premium product. So that's really why customers that uh, don't want to dive into 5G still need to look at a 5G endpoint because the 4G network is just light years beyond what it was when they first purchased their device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to to add on to that, I I guess. Um, so when you're when you're talking about your Cat six modem, right? You're talking about a modem that's capable of up to 300 megabits a second. So not bad as far as your your performance goes. But when you make the jump to a Cat twenty modem, you're talking over six times uh, speed throughput capabilities in the newer product, and this is in part due to advancements in LTE that the carriers have put, you know, new technology into their towers to support and everything, right? And that's another reason to talk about this upgrading, right? Is because the carriers will start to get rid of some of the older technology to make room for the newer technology. Reason that the 3G network is going away, they need to make that spectrum available for and to support 5G, right? So newer technology is really, where you want to put the money towards just because you help future proof yourself as, as you go yep, on. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So let's uh, take a look at some of these uh, devices that we've been talking about. Uh, so let's start with the uh, AER 1600, 1650. Uh, we've got the end of life as November 2nd of next year. Uh, what are some of the, the use cases? And then, you know, why, why do you think the E300 is the, uh, the recommended replacement? I might uh, start this one with David. So, I mean, the Air 1600 served, it served multiple different uh, purposes, right? Um, some people wanted a little bit of diff additional horsepower um, for their simple failover devices, um, or they're using it for a small branch office, you know, five, 10 people maybe um, connected to that at the most, right? Um, that's really what the use case of this device was for, was for that small branch um, location. Uh, but uh, I had mentioned failover. A lot of people started leveraging it for failover just because it brought some newer modem technologies inside of it than some of our other adapters at the time. Uh, so they would take advantage of that from there. Um, the E300, it's, it is the replacement for the 1600. And it's a replacement that I'll call the device itself is at least three to four times faster built in um, processor memory wise. And then you add in the newer cellular technology that's in it. So the, the E300 comes with a CAT7 or a CAT18 modem, right? So to your point, that gigabit mode class modem, whereas the 1600, it stopped at that category six modem. So no newer modems could be put into it basically to leverage it. And that's in part because of the processing power. It just wasn't there to handle that gigabit class um, LTE capability. Yeah, for sure. Reed, um, you know, as someone who who sells these, what do uh, what do a lot of the customers you now seem to think about the E300? Do they 
Um, is it fitting a lot of needs? You know, what kind of use cases do you see in it used in? Yeah, the number one use case I see out there, I think the failover market for the E300 is still quite mature. To David's point, when the customer needs something beyond an adapter, right, a router, a true branch router with some intelligence mm -hmm. and some advanced routing capabilities, they're more gravitating towards the E300 series, right? If they go to NetCloud Advanced Package over just that bare minimum essentials package, they unlock an advanced threat protection security suite, uh, they can do content filtering, uh, there's a lot of application aware traffic steering, right, in a failover event if you only want to back up certain applications or certain uh, MAC addresses of devices on your network or clients, right, that's entirely capable with this device versus your traditional adapter, let alone having uh, things like QoS, which really help for that quality of life with VoIP calls. Say if you're a sales organization and you're in failover and phone calls are your lifeblood, right, mm -hmm. being able to help smooth out the jitter there with that, that uh, uh, QS quality of service is what that stands for. And really, I think uh, because we're seeing, again, the, the most mature point of 4G technologies and the addition of 5G technologies, uh, really what we've been seeing out there in the market, customers being more and more willing to look at 4G endpoints as a wireline replacement, right? Mm -hmm. 5G endpoints are definitely the hot topic for wireline replacement. But there's no reason for the small branch office, something like this E300 series router mm -hmm. with that gigabit class modem couldn't fill the same niche. Oh, yeah. And what I mean by that is you mentioned it earlier, David, you've got that firewall embedded into it. It acts as its own network switch. I'm fairly certain the E300 has a fiber port on it, too. I mean, I know we're talking primary, but if you just need it to be a switch slash firewall slash failover all in one, right? It can serve that capacity. So I really look at the E-Series, um, and the, the Air 1600 was this way, right? But we're, we're getting to the point where it's into life. The E-Series is really a branch consolidation device if customers are really looking to consolidate their rack, flatten their rack to one endpoint, mm -hmm. and then again, be either that fixed wireless primary, firewall and switch all in one, or just be that failover component, firewall and switch all in one. So right. I think a lot of customers out there are seeing uh, this particular product fit. And also for customers that are looking for uh, dual carrier capability because you can add a module modem mm -hmm. to this and then you can do load balancing to get a little bit more elegant processing power and the ability to service multiple clients. Um, but what you can also do here is if you say, hey, you know, I don't trust Verizon only I want to have a backup, then okay, go get your T-Mobile backup or your AT&T yeah. backup or vice versa, right? And then you can have two different carriers and you can have some ultra redundancy uh, with 4G business internet plans out there today, often very uber competitive with wireline rates. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's pretty interesting what we're seeing out there. But customers, definitely, if you have 1600s, now's the time. Uh, any of our wireless friends out there, if you know customers that have 1600s, uh, we've got about a year roadmap until those are into support. So for reasons we stated earlier, definitely let's get on the phone and let's talk about moving to an E-Series uh, router or, or some of the other endpoints we'll see here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's take a look at the AER2100 now. Uh, so there's that 531 date you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, now this one, the recommended replacement, we have the E300, but we also have the E3000. Uh, David, you care to talk about that a little bit? Well, so, I mean, the Air 2100 was basically the big brother to yeah. the 1600, right? It had a little bit better, more horsepower, a little bit more memory in it. Um, same modem technologies, fundamentally, right? So same, uh, you know, Category 6 uh, modem technologies at the max. So you're, you're looking at something that's a bit beefier, a bit larger than the 1600. That's what the purpose of this was. So you're, you're talking small mid-branch. Um, right, whereas the the E the 1600 and the E 300, you could use as a simple pop up, um, but we're recommending both the 300 and the 3000 here for for a couple different reasons, right? The 3000 is obviously the big brother to the 300, but the 300 has uh, is probably about twice as fast as what the 2100 was in terms of system performance and capabilities, right? So you can start stacking on some of those security services and still keep you know, the same footprint, the same speed and throughput capabilities of it. So, I mean, they're, they're really, it, you, you can't 
hurt yourself by going with either product. It really depends on what your needs are. Um, one thing I will note with the E3000 is it does come in a 5G variant, right? So it has its gigabit class, CAT18, but it also has a 5G model. So that's something you don't have today with the 300. Um, but, you know, it, it really depends on what the needs of the organization are, you know, why you would be replacing that, that legacy 2900. Yeah, traditionally, right, if you get more into a mid-size office environment, you add that additional processing power, that memory, and you move to a 5G endpoint with that E3000, right, those are the main advantages. You've got the SFP port capabilities to add in a fiber line if you want it to serve as backup to your fiber. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of customers with SD-WAN appliances, too, are currently looking at active-active. Right. So what I mean by that is not only is their fiber being primary, but at the same time, they're leveraging on WAN 2, the 5G cradle point circuit from the E3000. And so uh, a lot of flexibility with the E3000, more range for that mid-market office, that mid-market customer and the enterprise customer. Or even if, let's say you have a clinic with lots of clients out there, as many universities, right? Uh, let's take UT Med here. Mm -hmm. They've got clinics all across and uh, a great use case for the E3000 for fixed wireless primary is this endpoint right here. Yeah. It also gives them the firewall security. It also gives them a uh, much more expanded uh, LAN WAN switchable port capacity mm -hmm. as well. And so again, it can act as that rack flattener and consolidate a few different things. So there's a lot of flexibility. And then if customers want to get absolutely wild, right, they want something like the W2005, mm -hmm. which is an adapter, consolidates the antenna element of traditional LTE deployments with the modem, puts it in one housing, make it 5G CAT20 modem, and then stick it on the roof. Uh, you can actually use the E3000 for a little bit more sophistication and intelligence, mm -hmm. a controller, if you will, and use that W2005 as a captive modem that's just providing the WAN to the intelligence that the E3000 provides. So, um, again, if you got a 2100 out there, you needed that beef and that power for your application, for your branch, or whatever you're doing with it. Definitely the E3000 is something to consider. 4G and 5G available, both gigabit class. And uh, the great thing about the 5G is that uh, 5G just keeps getting better. So you're investing in the best 4G technology with uh, increasing 5G uh, speeds mm -hmm. as the carriers get more mature in their deployments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see, we've got one more we're going to look at here. Um, and again, if we don't cover you know, what you want, feel mm -hmm. free to drop it in the chat and we can get to it in the Q&A. Uh, but the CBA 50, uh, another uh, November 2nd of 2023. Um, David, what are we looking at as far as, uh, you know, some of these replacements? So the CBA 50 is probably one of the most known devices in our portfolio. We'll put it, um, I think we probably deployed more of these of almost anything else, um, you know, in the U S and the, the, the great thing about it is it's just an adapter. It's not even a router, right? So it provides that connectivity that people have needed. Um, especially through, you know, 3G starting to move to 4G and now as we're moving to 5G. Um, but one of the limiting factors with that was the products nearing a 10 year life on it, right? So we're, we're nearing, it's probably around eight years at this point. We've got older CPU, older chips within this device. And I, I don't know how many people are, are aware here, but you know, we, we've got a chip issue going on, right? And as you need some of these older chips, you're starting to pay a more, a higher premium for these older chips because the manufacturers are starting to process and build on newer chips. They don't want to keep the old fabs and old technology if they can build newer, you know. So they're, they're looking to move more to that. So the 850, in a way, is part of a cost savings as well, as at least long term, because these chips and the costs with them. Um, one of the chips in this device is it's now into the low hundreds um, for just a single chip in that device, right? So we're trying to steer away from some of these older chips just because of that. Um, but also we want to be able to provide the best and newest um, to our customers and, and our partners. Um, but the A50, it, it served a great life. And Rather than replace it with a single model, we're looking at kind of breaking it up a bit to target specific industries, to target specific customers for this. 
um, rather than sticking with a single one. So we're actually showcasing three of them here and Reed had already mentioned um, the W2005. So I'll start actually from right to left on this one. So the W2005 is our outdoor 5G um, sub six adapter. Well, C band adapter, yeah. So what that gives us is that gives us the ability to get out of whatever building infrastructure you might be in that could potentially cause interference without extending antennas, which could provide loss in that signal back to the router. Instead, you got an ethernet cable providing that connectivity. So next to zero loss, running an ethernet cable to wherever your router is and to Reed's point, connecting it to that E3000, maximizing the benefits of having both devices paired together you it looks as one device within that cloud right rather than having to manage two separate devices it, it will appear as one um so in the middle here we got the 1850 which is also 5g device um it, it's an indoor only device however and does have antennas for it and all that stuff but like the 850 it's meant to go where the signal is but keep it indoors right so there are some organizations that they can't drill holes they can't you know, go through the roof, that kind of stuff, because they're limited. Um, you know, shopping malls are a great example of that, right? So trying to find the signal in the best way possible, we, we make smaller adapters that you can place, you know, on top of shelves, you know, kind of hidden out of the way, but you're able to harness 5G with this indoor adapter. And then the L950 being the cellular, uh, cellular LTE only adapter um, as part of that, LTE replacement piece of it. Again, indoor only. Um, and it's a really small pancake device, right? As opposed to, you know, inch and a half thick um, CVA 850. So it definitely fits in your little one U that you have available in your rack, but, um, you know, can really go anywhere that you want to just to get the signal back in for you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Reed, what are your thoughts on, on these devices? Where are you seeing them at? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So the W2005, where we're seeing it is, it's probably the most mature 5G offering from a fixed branch perspective okay. that CradlePoint offers. And again, it's an adapter, right? So it doesn't have some of that intelligence that the E-Series has, but what it, what it does is it provides pure WAN connectivity, right? If you're just looking for a pure data pipe, W2005 for a couple of reasons is great. I mentioned earlier how it takes the traditional router and then antenna on the roof uh, type of schematic and it marries the two into one housing. What it does there is in a traditional external antenna uh, over the course of 15 feet, 30 feet, 50 feet, 75 feet, 100 feet of coax, you'd actually lose signal quality down into your rack, right? Or down to your cradle point unit. Mm -hmm. And so what was at the roof could be humming signal, let's use uh, analogy, everybody understands bars, right? Could have been five bars of signal. Mm -hmm. uh, was really getting downgraded to two or one bars over the course okay. of that coax and not really providing the bandwidth that the device was capable of. Well, the great thing about this is that you marry the two, so there's no signal loss between actual modem and antenna elements, but then you can run a CAT6 cable down to your network rack to the edge appliance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the nature of CAT6 cabling is that you don't have loss for up to 300 feet, right? So uh, in uh, standard coax, you'd have loss right at 15 feet, yeah. uh, 30 feet. And then as you kept going up incrementally, it would get so severe that it would be unusable, mm -hmm. uh, whether from a throughput or latency perspective. Right. So the W2005 is absolutely phenomenal. And where we're seeing a lot of it is uh, anyone that owns their building, right, that has and reserves a right for building penetration, uh, but needs either augmented bandwidth from a wireless source or needs that failover, or if they have a site that it's just the trench out costs for fiber or for coax, mm -hmm. broadband are just too much for them. They can look at this as an instant ROI one notable example, we worked with a uh, medium business out in California recently, North California. They had a wireline provider that was charging them $2,500 for a backup fiber circuit per location. Mm -hmm. The customer saw the capabilities of the W2005. They could penetrate the roof and put it on the roof. And they saw really their minimum viable signal in a failover event was 20 megs uh, down mm -hmm. and uh, 10 up. They saw the capabilities of the W2005, and for them, it was a no-brainer right. for them, right? They had instant ROI as soon as they cut the lines on those fiber uh, backup connections, mm -hmm. but it made a lot of sense there. 
Uh, same for W1850. I tell customers all the time, you'd be surprised even if you can't penetrate a roof, what those standard paddle antennas that come with the W1850 can actually pick up in yeah. terms of cellular gain. A uh, perfect example, we were working with a large uh, warehousing company and they were actually a unique case. They had uh, this, uh, basically, they had these really high voltage power lines creating this Faraday cage between uh, the roof and the actual nearby tower. Okay. And so the high voltage was scrambling the RF to where it was non-viable up on the roof. And so what we found is testing with the W2005 yielded very poor results, not because it's a bad modem, right. but because of third party elements. Mm -hmm. But we went into the building with a W1850 with just the standard stock SMA connected antennas. We call them paddles because they kind of look like paddles, right? Yeah. But um, they actually were receiving remarkable results uh, through this metallic warehouse with those stock antennas. And so it's not a bad shake to look at the W1850. David mentioned shopping malls, strip malls, mm -hmm. uh, retailers that are just renting space instead of owning space. Right. Um, these are the use cases where we're seeing all of these devices. And again, not to forget the L950, but a great little product, especially for the small business customer mm -hmm. or the smaller branch footprint that just needs that LT connection with no intelligence behind it or routing capabilities mm -hmm. uh, for pure handoff, right? Uh, great across the board for all of these. That CB850, luckily right now, we've, we've got basically a little over a year at this point until we hit into support for a good portion of the models, not all the models, right? The Cat uh, 8, excuse me, the Cat 18 model is still gonna have a long life in front of it in terms of support, but our early adopters, I know a lot of large retail out there, um, a lot of mid-market, multi-location customers mm -hmm. out there, double down on the 1850. So if you've got that LP6, you've got that LPE, if you've got that LP or LE unit, right? This is the time to look at the three devices here because they can really bring some serious gains for your sure. operation. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you both for that. Um, let's see. I know we've seen a couple um, chats. We'll definitely get to those uh, at the end here. But four uh, G or five G? You know, we've talked about this uh, a couple of times. Um, you know, when does it make sense to go one or the other? Uh, Reed, I might push this one to you first. Yeah. So, uh, you know. It's an interesting equation right now. I would really consider us still in the infancy stage mm -hmm. of 5G. We are seeing in certain metropolitan areas, right? The ideology is all the NFL cities out there, pro sports cities are our primary markets. That's where mm -hmm. the opportunity is greatest for our carriers to bring customers over to 5G because of population density, right? right? Plain and simple. Yep. Um, and then you've got your mid-market, then you've got your kind of small rural markets or extended markets out there. But we're still really in the infancy of what 5G is promising and we really don't have to unpack all of that here. Mm -hmm. um, that's another topic for another day. Yep. But what I really feel is that uh, two things, right? We talked about the maturity of 4G at this point. That's nationwide, right? Even in tertiary those uh, rural or extended markets, 4G is at its absolute most mature. And then 5G, you'd be surprised how 5G is just sliced, low band 5G, and then of course C band or mid band, depending on the carrier, in secondary markets at the very least at this point, uh, is providing some surprising signals. The good news today for customers that are on the fence for this conversation right here is Every single Cradle Point 5G product is backwards compatible with 4G. Right. That means, going back to the conversation we had before, the experience you're seeing on Cat 20 5G modems that are in the E3000 5G, that are in the W1850, the W2005, or the R1900, which is their mobility product, um, is remarkably greater. We ran a speed test uh, not that long ago with an IVR900, with a CAT18 modem, the latest, greatest 4G modem, and the R1900 CAT20 modem, same location, same carrier, identical SIM cards, and the IVR900 pulled about 65 down, mm -hmm. the R1900 pulled 175 down, same 4G network. Mm -hmm. So the reality here is people that are on the fence, the conversation is not, oh, 5G's 
it's not in our area, right? We're in an outlying market or we're a mid market. Another person I was talking to earlier today was in Nashville, which I think is a primary market, right? NFL yeah. city. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't see enough gain for 5G. And I said, well, you know what? The conversation really isn't about 5G. 5G is an improving currency. It's like when you drive the car off the lot, uh, the value goes down instantly and it drops hard. When you yeah. drive the cradle point off the lot, it actually gets better over yeah. time uh, because of 5G. But the reality is the conversation for these customers is really, hey, what is the experience like on the most mature 4G offering on the market today? Mm -hmm. I'm willing to bet it's five to six to seven to eight times greater. Yeah. And what are your minimum required speeds? Mm -hmm. Minimum viable speeds, right? That's really the conversation. Yeah. And once their eyes are open and they understand that analogy that you drive it off the lot and it increases in value mm -hmm. and efficiency, then that's really something that I drive customers towards. The last thing I say, and I'm sorry, David, I'm kind of filibustering here because I'm passionate about this topic, mm -hmm. is that um, really when, when 4G first hit the market, right, 4G really came out and it was this business revolutionizing product. 3G had really been about the consumer mm -hmm. because it launched the smartphone. Yeah. And 2G before that for our flip phones or Blackberries or whatever was being used in those days. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once we got the 4G, you all had all this innovation with Uber and Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Airbnb, all these technology companies that could take off because 4G was finally for the business, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, it was for the business, but it enabled a lot of consumer focused apps sure. to launch and really revolutionized a lot of things. Really, 4G in a business perspective, SMB and enterprise and even government mm -hmm. was seen, okay, it's the tertiary connection, it's the backup connection, it's the fail safe. Mm -hmm. Well, what we've seen as 4G has matured in the infancy of 5G is that uh, wireline and wireless are starting to converge, oh, yeah. right? So businesses are approaching the conversation, talking to Comcast for that wireline, but also having the conversation with Verizon Wireless or T-Mobile or AT&T right. about fixed wireless access or wireless is primary. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, what's happening is that the big enterprises that have SD-WAN are looking at wireless as augmentation, right? Hey, we've got expanded bandwidth needs. A uh, perfect example would be a barcade uh, type customer that has virtual reality based stuff that needs to be connected to the internet. Highly bandwidth intensive. And so if they can bring in a second pipe that's giving them in some markets up to another 200 down, yeah. then that's extremely viable for them, oh, yeah. let alone serving as backup. So that's active, active. Where we're going, I think, with what we've seen from carrier rate plans on 5G for the business and soon to be for the public sector, and what we are seeing in terms of wireline prices fluctuating, uh, generally the trend is up, I do believe there will come a point where wireless will potentially be the front runner for that primary circuit. And then you're looking at wireline as augmentation or backup. And yeah. so really when you talk about 4G or 5G, right, investing in 5G today only means that you uh, increase in value and efficiency and performance over time. So again, uh, really, again, it's by use case for the customer, but if you have business use cases for that higher uh, maximum 4G experience mm -hmm. or even investing forwardly in 5G, then I would say that uh, go ahead and go with 5G. Plus, in terms of Cradle Points Roadmap, you're going to see at least five years uh, from uh, today on support. Mm -hmm. And that's only if they did an end of life announcement tomorrow. But if my gut, I feel that even some of their lower or their earlier launched 5G endpoints, we at least have seven to eight years of roadway in front of us oh, on yeah. those endpoints. So it's a very much, it's going to be a very uh, longevity conducive investment at this point. So I'll step off my soapbox, my filibuster. David, I said a lot. Uh, what would you add to this conversation, 4G or 5G, if the customer is trying to decide? So, I mean, there, there's not much I can add to what you've already said. I mean, one of one thing that I think of is, you know, if you have the budget to do it, I would look to invest in the 5G today. The carriers may not be where you are yet. They're coming. Yeah. 
right? There, there's no doubt about it. They, they want to spread this as far as they can, to your point, you know, going after Comcast and stuff. The carriers want to displace wireline. So they're going to go at great lengths to improve their networks to a point where you can displace that wireline with a true full wireless service. So if you do have it in your budget, definitely take a look at it. Um, the, the great thing about a lot of our, uh, our devices and our technology is it's all firmware upgradable, right? So almost everything that you'll be able to take advantage of with 5G over the next three, five, seven years, you'll be able to utilize you know, the same product that you buy today um, just through those firmware updates and through those enhancements um, as they come around with certifications and everything, right? So uh, definitely if you think you'll want it or need it in the future, um, Reed had mentioned, you know, as LT was coming about and the length, well, the advancements in the technology and how it brought us all these new Ubers and Facebook and all that, you know, basically a computer in your hand. Um, on a day to day, we're not sure everywhere that 5G is going to go. AR VR is kind of the first start of that. That's where we've seen some applications in that real time, you know, you know, high throughput, low latency uh, capabilities of it. But it, it, there's only telling what's going to come, right? And you might have that next technology that can leverage the service if you have it and you're able to build on it early. Um, so. Uh, Definitely worth taking a look at, but if you find that you just need it as a supplemental connectivity, you know, 4G doesn't hurt, um, right? 4G and 5G, are they're going to work synonymously for a long time to come. Um, there's no, no set timeline for when 4G might go away. I mean, 3G was around for, for a, couple, a couple years, we'll call it, right? It, it was around a long time, and the carriers finally needed to scoop back some of that, that um, spectrum, as I mentioned earlier four to support their 5g so um the way 4g and 5g are today uh, they're going to work hand in hand for for a long time to come so you can't go wrong with either but as i said if you have it in your budget definitely take a look at the 5g see what it can do for you yeah absolutely uh thank you both for uh those thorough answers on it as far as the gsa schedule raj i imagine we can just get back to you on that yeah definitely uh raj you know, I don't know if my contact information is on a slide on this show, but uh, that's definitely something that uh, if you send me a note, I kind of act like the um, contracting uh, nexus of knowledge here, for lack of a better term. So more than happy to do some discovery with you and figure out uh, what exactly you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Perfect. I can actually facilitate that as yep. well. So don't worry about it, Raj. I'll, I'll get you set up. And then uh, one more thing. I see Raj's last question mm -hmm. to Bill. Uh, Bill from Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. <laughs> Love you, Bill. But um, so Raj, also, uh, we can get a recommended replacement list from CradlePoint as well. What we can do is we can also offer a end of life into support matrix as well, just so you can see and highlight which endpoints uh, are in need of replacement as we approach two major end of support dates, which are the end of May, 2023, and uh, earlier on in November of 2023 are the two kind of line in the sand marks for most of the endpoints that are going into life next year. Awesome. Uh, well, we're getting decently close to time, so I think we might go ahead and call it. Those are the only questions that I've seen come through. If you have anything else, uh, feel free to, uh, to message us. You know, we've got forms on our website. You can message us on LinkedIn if you want. Um, you know, a couple of different ways to get into contact, but uh, we're happy to, uh, to help you out with any questions you might have. So thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, Reed. Thank you, David. Do you guys have any parting words or anything you want to leave our audience with? I think my only parting word, if you're a customer with a legacy device, definitely you still see value in that solution. Uh, it does behoove you to get ahead of those in the support dates. Uh, if you don't see value, still call me because I promise you there is value and we can help tap back into that for these solutions that once served a great purpose for you. And then lastly, for the customers that might be here or even some of our wireless partners, mm -hmm. right? I think the, the main point going back to that 4G or 5G question is uh, as long as it's one or the other, and you are preparing for things like wireline outages and you are looking at a better uh, cost of ownership for establishing some kind of internet circuit at that challenging location, right? Uh, my recommendation is just have your eye on Cradle Point and their capabilities 
have your eye on a good partnership like RCN that can help you cut through noise and make the most out of your deployment uh, from a design and a support perspective. And I think that you are in a good spot. So I would just, you know, recommend to people to jump in the race or mm -hmm. jump in the pool if you haven't already. Absolutely. Uh, David, any, any last words here? No. No, it's, it's been great being on. Thanks yeah, for inviting thank me. so much for joining. And thank you to everyone who watched. So uh, I know we have another webinar, I believe, two weeks from today. should be the 13th. Uh, there's more information on our LinkedIn page, so be sure to check that out. But uh, with that being said, thank you guys so much. Have a good rest of your day.